Did you have a formative first encounter with Clay? I feel like I did, you know, and I, I remember it very well. I was in high school. It was, I, I had one high school class in ceramics and pottery, and uh, it was right at the end of my um, stay in high school, the last semester in high school, spring 1972, which makes it 50 years this year. Mm. And um, I remember struggling mightily, and, and there were some other really talented people in that in the class. And a lot of really interesting people in that class that went on in the arts, thanks to the teacher. But I struggled. It wasn't easy for me. And I remember getting the first piece out. I signed it and everything. And, and um, it was just a little tiny bowl that I'd thrown on the wheel that had some drips, <laughs> some drips on it. And I thought it was a miracle. I held it in my hands. It was warm. I held it in my hands, and it changed me. I, I can't account for it, really, except that um, I, I kind of, when I think back about it, it was... It was like I walked into that studio, I saw that thing, and I never left the studio, mm -hmm. you know. And um, it's all I wanted to do, it's all I thought about. And to, the, to this day, um, you know, that's been my life. What were some of the early lessons you learned when you were first starting out, and how, um, did you retain them? Did you push against them? What was your from, from teachers? Yeah, or, yeah, what from, was your edu education, education yeah. in clay like? <clears throat> well, I, for for whatever reason, I I had I had good self discipline, maybe from you know from baseball or from my mother or something. But my education in ceramics was about eleven years, if you include three years in Japan, which was n not part of a school training, but I was you know working there. Uh, and I think in those 11 years, I engaged about four or five institutions on the East Coast and the West Coast, and probably 16 different teachers. Mm. You know, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in all of them. And, I, and most of them were, I, can I say this on tape, they weren't that good. They mm -hmm. weren't good teachers. I didn't identify them as good teachers. And, but I was interested in them because I, I was a teacher. I was going to be a teacher. And so I, I, I watched all my teachers. And I learned from all of them about good teaching, bad teaching, and you, know, you name it. And, but my first teacher, Lloyd Baskerville in high school, was very special. And he, he somehow, I think, learned how to read people. He was patient. And he learned how to read people so that when he spoke to you, he was speaking to you. He, 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 it wasn't a cookie cutter um, tape he was running through. He really spoke to you deeply and he affected a lot of people in different ways and sent them on to become musicians and glass blowers and, and people working in ceramics and writers and painters. Mm. And, and uh, we all kind of fanned out and, and, and stayed in the arts for a long time and all of us I'm sure would say Lloyd had a lot to do with it. You know. So, I still think about those things. I, I think about Tetsuzo Shimoka too, because he, he wasn't assigned to me as a teacher. And I, my experience in Japan wasn't in a school. And it was what I really yearned for, um, was, to, was to be around someone that modeled artistic behavior and, and modeled the thing that other people taught me academically, which I, I had a hard time appreciating uh, being taught academically. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to be with artists and, 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 and believe, um, have them speaking to me out of their own personal experience with as, as an artist. Um, and I didn't have that um, through almost all of my formal education in school. And so, as a teacher, that really, you know, those are the things I paid attention to. And, you know, when I, came, when I was able to teach in university, everyone had to work. All the teachers had to work. And, so, a lot of the lessons I learned from, from teachers um, relate back to teaching, mm -hmm. you know, which is really important to me. In terms of making, though, I, I think a lot of things, I, it's harder to describe where all that stuff comes from, you know, but a lot of it has had to do with paying attention to things and, um, and then teaching myself how to act on things I was, was uh, appreciating or noticing how to act on that stuff artistically. And I think when I ask about teachers, I, I, mean, I mean the term very expansively, not just a teacher in front of you in a classroom, mm -hmm. but experiences you've had, uh, things you looked at. You know, what, what do you point to as 
important teachers along the way? Well, I would say my mother, for one, mm. <laughs> Be because um, she was so devoted to the arts and, and, and there, there weren't, um, I feel like maybe one of the most important things I learned from her about art had to do with the fact that, um, that you entered into things without foreknowledge of reward. Mm. Um, that you entered into things that you were passionate about and you, you give everything to it and um, you pursue it as, as passionately and deeply as you can, but you don't know if there's any rewards at the end of that. And so you don't, you don't go into things waiting to know that there's a reward for it. And that's from my mother, I mm. believe. And, and that's been great because that just allowed me to, to be curious, you know, and then whatever I was curious about to kind of try to approach it with, with, with enough rigor to really interrogate it, you know, really go deeply into it. Most of the things I've made, or most of the ways in which I've worked in, in, in a serial fashion, um, I've stayed in them for sometimes 10 years, uh, investigating them. And sometimes there's dual tracks, you know, in my curiosities. But once I'm curious about something, I go into it very deeply and try to exhaust it. And, and I think that without knowing, like I've done things for two or three years that never saw the light of day because they just didn't produce anything viable. But, I, but that didn't stop me and from being all in, you know. And so I think that, that's a little bit abstract, but that's, that was an important lesson that really um, has followed me and I think paid off in, in, a lot of, in ways that feel interesting to me because they've, it's allowed me to discover a lot of things. And I think that's really exciting. Discovery is really exciting. Discovery out of curiosity is, is part, a big part of self-actualization, you know, who you are. And so just in, just in those terms, I think um, that's, that was really important. And I thank my mother for that, largely. I would think that would have a very direct corollary to working in the studio with just experimenting yeah. and following your curiosity? I, yeah, because um, first of all, ceramics is very mysterious. You, you can approach ceramics any way you want, you know. It, you, you can be highly scientific about it, which is to kind of dispel mythologies, you know, um, scientifically. Or you can kind of take it on like an alchemist, where it's magical. And, and uh, I'm that, you know. So it's always been kind of magical to me because it's earth science. And it's of the earth. It's all the materials of the earth subjected to heat like the earth was. And you form something uh, it's kind of, there's a, there's a magical, kind of par partially inexplicable um, thing, transformation and phenomenology that happens in ceramics that, that, is, that has me very, very deeply curious. In the studio, every day I see things, and my work's a reflection of that. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, actually. It's very exciting to go to the studio and, and, and be open to what might come up and then I ha have the, the discipline and the kind of some of the methodologies in place to pursue things and, and kind of uncover stuff and discover stuff and, um, and, and have it stay fresh because you, you never know what you're going to see. And so I'm always opening the kiln, hoping to see something I've never seen. Mm. And it happens, you know. It means that I have to try things I've never tried, you know. And so one thing feeds another and it's, it's as much as I mean, I, I think I've learned, it, it's, it's built me as much, my work's built me as much as I've built my work, put it that way, and in, in terms of how I've learned to think and be open to things and um, understand how to pursue things in ways that might lead me to something, um, if, you, if you know, just we're in, we're in the midst of some work here, and if you look at the earlier work, it is... Um, project driven, it's idea driven or concept driven, you know. And so I had to have a plan in order to make it because I had an idea I wanted to make. Um, and it's, it kind of has a, has a minimalistic language to it, you know. And that kind of work that's idea driven in a serial fashion and minimalistically oriented, where you're constantly, re you're, you're acting reductively and paring down. That, that's a funnel, you know, that takes you down and down a rabbit hole, mm -hmm. and it, th there's an end game to that. It, it has to end, you know, when you're being increasingly minimal and idea-driven. So I did that for about 20 years, you know, 
And, and the work since then, though, is exactly the opposite of that. And it's eruptive, and it's open-ended, it's intuitive, and it, um, I'm just trying to follow results in the moment, which allows me to do whatever I think could be done. And, and that is, is more like the other end of the funnel. You know? and so ideas are going, kind of atomizing out, and I just follow the things I'm curious about, and it's, it's not, it doesn't feel like it's closing down on me. It feels like it's opening up. You know? I, I love that. The show contains decades of, of work, and I know you've resisted the term retrospective, but strongly. <laughs> but the process of putting it together, it seems, has invited a lot of retrospection and introspection. introspection yeah. uh, what has emerged for you as you've looked back, and what has surprised you? We call it a survey. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a right. survey. I'm As just, you survey <laughs> your, your decades. Um, it's been interesting because I've never collected my own work. I've never saved anything, really. I, I have the first piece I made. That's about it. And I, I, did, I did that consciously. First of all, I didn't want to live with my work. I love making it. Um, but I wanted my work to go out in the world and serve me and, and be available and create opportunities for me. And I sent everything out, I, and even against my better judgment sometimes. Some, some objects would come along and I was like, ah, oh, that's a little bit different. There's some, I, need, I, should, I need to digest that. I should live with it, but then I'd send it off, you know. And, and, and mostly things not, never to come back, you know. Mm -hmm. So in the process of creating the show, we had to go out and find things. And, um, and it was hard because I, I was never fastidious about records, you know, really. I had to go back to old dealers and ask them what they knew and how to contact people. And some pieces I knew. But the strange thing that happened when, I, when pieces started to come back was I, I, wanted, I wanted them back. Mm -hmm. I, I want them all back now. I want them. Mm -hmm. I, I want to live with them now. And I don't know why. I like them. I, I, I don't know. I, I think they did their job. And, and I've, always, I've always really admired artists who considered their work like their children and they didn't want to give them up. I've known a lot of artists like that and I've worked with a lot of people like that. And I, I always admired that about them, that somehow their work w was very personal and, and meaningful and close to them and they wanted to keep it. And, um, and I always felt kind of a little bit shabby for not feeling that way and sending everything <laughs> off, you know. But now I feel that way. I, I see things and um, I respect them and I, I kind of I have this secret desire to have them back and have them around me for the, the, the next few years, you know. It's not going to happen, but <laughs> that's the way I feel. They're teaching you or reminding you where you've been, how, yeah. you, how you've yeah. got here, how you got here. And the, the work takes so many formal turns, um, as you describe. Um, but there are some key through lines and some patterns of thought. Um, and one of them is clearly the engagement with the vessel. Mm -hmm. um, it's an essential form, as you've described it, and it has essential functions, as you've also described, to, mm -hmm. to hold, to preserve, to offer, to commemorate, to beautify. Can you talk about this seemingly inexhaustible relationship you have with the vessel? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of known it for a long time, and I, I haven't really strayed from it. I, very, very, I mean, grad school for a while, just because I wanted to be really purely experimental, and that taught me a lot. But um, as soon as I left grad school, like that, you know, I left that sandbox. It, I, I got right back to the vessel. That's where I wanted to be, and um, I, I felt like it's such a. The, the, the pottery ceramic vessel, and it's a lot of things, um, but it's basically pan-cultural. It, 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 it's, it's existed through all of civilized time. And every culture has done different things with it that they needed to do with it and had different inventions related to it, different technological inventions, different aesthetic inventions. And it, it's really this beautiful registration of, of cultural belief systems you know, mm -hmm. around the world. So when I, when I look at vessels, when I go to museums, or I look, I'm, they, they're deeply encoded for me um, and, and talk about cultural values and cultural distinctions. And, um, and, but, but essentially, they're, they're, they're a human invention. They're this very, very strange human invention that has reshaped the world in many ways. You know? 
and they, they operate in a very strange space between culture and nature, you know. And, and so th those kind of things fascinate me, and, and the ways in which vessels have, um, ceramic vessels, have uh, done, done the bidding of different cultural needs um, is also, that, that history is very fascinating. I teach it and I study it and I've always been fascinated by it. And so my work has really, has, has been about that and, uh, and, and as many ways as I can divine into it and, and come up with things that feel meaningful to me. But most recently, and having to think more about my work, I, I've had to write about it and talk about it and stuff, but um, I've never paused enough. I've just kind of fell forward for about 35 years, you know, and I'm having to pause now, obviously, and I, I think that, you know, all those things that I say, I've written about it, because at different times, you know, my work has, has, has used the history of pottery as subject matter, and as you, as you cited, um, to hold things, and to present things, and to preserve things, and to beautify, and ritualize, and commemorate, and, but I think actually, more and more, when I think about it, most of the work is, a, is more like a commemoration mm -hmm. and, um, than, than all those other things, although they, they do operate too. But um, I, 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 w I would hope, you know, I think, well, when I was younger, I used to worry. I used to worry uh, in the 80s, let's say, when I was making things, I, in, the, in the 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, I, I would think, I want this work to be timeless. I want it to feel timeless. Well, how do you do that, you know? I thought, yeah, you can make something feel timeless now and 20 years from now. It's going to be so time-stamped. Everyone's going, oh, they'll, they'll pinpoint it to the year it was made stylistically because you, a lot of that stuff comes through you. you, know? it, it, you it's a zeitgeist to the moment you're in the, and you filter it and it's encoded in the, in the work. And so uh, how do you make something timeless, really stretch time? And, and I, 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 I used to really worry about that. Um, your interest in the vessel touches on yeah. a lot of the vessel's history across time and across place. Mm -hmm. I know you referred to moon jars. Um, you've talked about the early importance to you of the Japanese tea cup. There, there's reliquaries. There's um, a lot of different types of vessel that you've engaged with and riffed on. Um, can you talk about your need to engage tradition and also reinvent? You know, maybe some, some of that comes from Shimoka because I came out of undergrad, an undergrad experience, and in America, there, there's not this deep sense of history, you know, and, and we're just, we're, we're enamored with the new all the time. And, and so in, in American art, there, there, there's just been this push to, to keep inventing and reinventing and um, climbing up the, the dead bodies of artists and staking new ground, you know, and, um, and new genres and new technologies and new, all the time. And America's kind of wonderful like that, you know. But when I went to Japan, I, I didn't see somebody working in the margins trying to establish something new. It was quite the opposite, you know. And Shimaoka kind of just like turned turned around and walked into history. He, he walked into deep history, especially if you're talking about Asian ceramic history. It's like <laughs> between the between the, the Koreans, the Chinese, and the Japanese. That's massive. That's every. That's almost everything. I mean, and if you want to include Islamic in there too. Uh, so what I saw was was a potter who walked right into the middle of deep history and then made space for himself. And I thought, wow, that's, that's powerful to me. To, 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 and pottery allows that because it's got a deep history that's knowable, you know. And so I just thought it was powerful and um, much more powerful than working in the margins to create something that, that no one's ever seen before. I mean, that's really hard to do anyway, but um, that, that wasn't as appealing to me as trying to be like him. Like I said, I, can't, I couldn't make his work, but I, I wanted to be like that. I thought that was great. So to, to kind of call on history um, in my own way, and not, not Japanese and not, and not in a country with a deep history um, or the one that identifies with a deep art history, um, to come back and, and use what I know of that history and what fascinates me of that history to make my own work 
and, uh, and, and, and have echoes of that in the work, I guess. And, and, and there, there, it's not all just homage. To, there's arguments, too. Mm -hmm. I'm arguing with history, in a way. I'm arguing with craft history and craft protocol. And I'm arguing with the materials, too. You know, there, there's, you know I, I think you could say there's, there, there's something that ranges between a polite discussion to a, to a brawl in my work. Brawl might overstate it, you know. Mm -hmm. But th there's serious arguments in the work for me. So um, I think history comes in uh, in all kinds of different ways, you know. Um, through craft history and through homage, through homage and through argument. When you talk about the importance of commemoration as a function, what are you commemorating and what, how many different levels of memory are embedded in, yeah. in a vessel that you're making? That's a really nice question. Because when, I, when, I, um, when, I, when we had our children, we had two children, when I got married, I, I never thought I'd be married. You know, and um, I never thought I'd be married, and so it was a bit of a miracle to me. <laughs> and I was starting to make work, and I was making. I was starting. I just came back from grad school, I was making vessels, and I I wanted to commemorate the idea of marriage. I didn't want to make it so personal that it was about you know that it had a date and a picture of two happy people on it and all that kind of stuff. But I I wanted to commemorate the idea of coupling and union and marriage and. So I made, I, I, I invented, you know, and for me at the time, invents a little strong, but I, I found and used a, a, a form language that allowed me to make certain kind of vessels that had a certain shape that was relevant, symbolically relevant to the idea of coupling and marriage, and then make objects that I would place and find ways to place inside the vessel. And that made the vessels, they, they gave them a job in, in, in the ways that pottery has had jobs, you know. And so I was commemorating the idea of marriage, and then we became pregnant, my wife did, and uh, I commemorated the idea of fertility. I have, I have some fertility vessels in the show. And I commemorated the idea of creation um, in, in the largest sense, in an artistic sense, and in, the, in kind of the, the magical sense of the creation of anything, and, um, and found a language to do that with vessels um, as a commemoration. And, um, and then also death. And because I was starting to lose people in my life, mm -hmm. and so I commemorated that. And so I, I was very, very um, directly dealing with the idea of commemoration and vessels. With pottery has a long history of commemorating things, you know, and uh, from the Greeks, uh, before the Greeks even. And, um, and so that was a one to one, you know, that was a kind of a. Um, a commemoration of a known thing in a way, or of a knowable thing in a way. And, but I, I feel like uh, that's been extended a lot without even really knowing it. Uh, commemoration for me is almost like celebration, you know. And I think that in the last about 10 or 15 years of my work, I've been, I've been just celebrating the, 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 the riotous, unique um, chroma ceramic chroma that uh, is available to people that work with clay. The, the chromatic qualities of, of glaze and, and glaze materials and earthen materials and minerals is remarkable under, under duress, under heat, you know. Uh, so painters don't quite get the colors we do, and uh, we don't get the colors painters do. And uh, I, I feel like the, the, it's, it's kind of a commemoration of my interaction with color and, and the phenomenology of glaze and glaze movement and um, kind of this eruptive quality that surfaces have and a very alive quality surfaces has. It's like the older I get, the more kind of wild my work is getting. Instead of, it's the other way around. When I was young, I was shy and I made shy things and I'm less shy now and my work is less shy. You know? But it's a, I, I think it's kind of a, just a commemoration of my, of my spirit in a way. It's a funny way to put it, but I, I don't know how else to say it. Well, as you said, you make the work and the work, I, work makes you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I fully understand it that way. And your, color-wise, your work has gone from one extreme to the other in yeah. terms of absolute restraint and quiet, um, kind of calm, uh, <laughs> absence of color to explosive, as you say, riotous and kind of uninhibited color. Unapologetic. Unapologetic. I've been called unapologetic yeah. lately. Yeah, I think 
and, and maybe that's confusing in the, in the exhibition, you know. But, but we're in, in, in the four galleries, um, you know, you're, you're talking about work that certainly there was, there was a run-up to, you know, my, my education. I was busy make, learning how to make things. And then, but, the, the, you know, this, the, the exhibition covers the work that was made after my education, so the last 35, 40 years, really. There's work in here that was in, in the galleries that is, goes back almost 40 years. So in 40 years, hopefully, an artist does a lot of different things. And, and, and so that's kind of the interesting thing to watch work grow and as a person grows, as an artist grows. And I was painfully shy. And I come back from Japan and understood by being in Japan the value of restraint. Uh, you know, that's a very powerful device, a very powerful social device in Japan. And um, being shy anyway, I was very shy, and um, being shy anyway and then understanding the power of restraint, th those, those two things went hand in hand for years. And I didn't want to use color because it, it, it made me very nervous. Col I couldn't understand. And I've been kind of formally oriented in my, in my life. I understand shape and form. Very, very well. I, I operate in space with it. I, I'm very comfortable with it. It's natural to me, but color's not. And I, I don't understand what color means. It's too. It's mercurial, you know. Color's wild and weird, and it, it, it's very hard to pin down. It's, it's very emotional. It, it deals with beauty and all kinds of things that are just so hard to quantify. And so I stayed away from it because I didn't know what it would mean. And I, and I was afraid of its superficiality um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of taking, knocking the stuffing out of serious things. <laughs> and um, there's probably some painters that want to strangle me right about now, you know. But that's the way I felt, you know. And, and so I, I dealt with brown, and I dealt with the color of the earth, the color of the clay, and I dealt with black, and I dealt with white, and I dealt with a little bit of blue. I understood those colors. Um, but as things went on, I, I realized I, I needed to kind of run at the things I was anxious about and run at the things that I w was running away from for so long. And, and so I, I, I started much more rigorously to try to engage color. And even to the point where I, in the last, through the pandemic, I'm making things that, that embarrass me. They, because they're, I'm embarrassed by them because they are a contradiction of my work. They're a contradiction of the history of my work. And, and so it's, it's, on the one hand, I understand it as naturally embarrassing, you know, because I'm, there's some part of me still shy. And I, I look at these things, it, they feel clownish to me because there's so much color. But I understand the value of being embarrassed too. And, mm -hmm. um, and no, knowing that that's a good thing and, it's good, and for me, after 40, 50 years, you know, it's a really good thing to feel free to contradict the history of my work. That's a really powerful thing. And, and not to get lost in um, superficial feelings about uh, embarrassment or anything like that. But that actually something important is happening. And that it's, 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 I, I need to follow it and just see where it goes and not worry about it. That ability to let go um, seems like... A something clean with age o over time to not hold so tight and um, control and color in practical terms for you as a ceramic artist is unpredictable so you're forced to let go yeah. if you're going to engage with color I I've been forced to let go a lot in the work I've lost a lot of work I've destroyed a lot of work and, I, and there were times I'm working on half of what I'm making this goes just doesn't it just fails technically or aesthetically or something like that. Um, another interesting byproduct of doing this is to, is to go back, because I've had to work with writers and, about the work, and is to go back and, and, and look at w when things change and why they change and what that, you know, why that might have happened. And I, I feel like that in a lot of cases I'll work extremely hard to, to build an institution. It, it's like a, in, in, in the work, I'm building institutions to ideas. I'm, I'm, I'm manifesting physical institutions. That means they, they're there, they're institutionalized in the work. It's a, an aesthetic institution or I don't know how else to put it. 
But I, I feel like as soon as I build a strong enough institution to something, I want to break it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found there's an impulse to, to, to um, contradict it and work against it. It gives me something to work against in my own work. And so I find myself not always in, in, in a smaller picture reinforcing the history of my own work, but working against it in some ways, while staying within a certain kind of um, territory of the vessel. You know. But there's so much room in there for me to, to play around. But it's, it feels really important to have something to, to argue with in my own work. And so there's that. And I think my mother also, um, towards the end of her life, pa painted because she was such a kind of a disciplined dancer as a ballerina. Uh, she wanted to draw and paint like that too. She, she, she studied the figure. She's, she was kind of very, 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 very accurate in the way she could draw. She taught herself to be accurate and to deal with the figure and, to, and, she's, and figure drawing and painting. But at the end of her life, um, the last two years of her life, the last three years of her life, two years when she was painting, at 92 and 93, she started, her, her brain changed. Uh, it was a form of dementia, just getting older, you know. And her brain changed artistically, and she would go back and get her old paintings that were figurative, that, you know, because she had thousands of them. <laughs> and she'd start painting over them abstractly with color. Mm -hmm. And at 93, 92, 93 years old, she's making these paintings that I was blown away because there was so much, they were so eruptive and so much color and abstraction of all things from someone that had been so disciplined as a dancer and a draw and painter, you know. Um, they, they were purely abstract. They were kind of this eruptive fields of color and mark making. And on top of old paintings, she just wrecked her old mm -hmm. paintings, you know. And that meant a lot to me. And I, I couldn't even talk to her about it because we weren't having those kind of conversations at that point. But I certainly encouraged her, and I kept buying paints and, <laughs> and pastel crayons and things like that. And she was putting glitter on her paintings. Mm. And it was wild, you know. And, and that was at 93, 94, 92, 93. I was like, wow, that's how, that's how you age as an artist. That's a good... Yeah. And I've heard about that, too, in some artists. But I, I see so many of my friends and colleagues kind of riding style into the sunset. Maybe mm -hmm. they just don't have... But I think artists... If they have better ideas, they enact them. If they don't, they don't, you know. Um, That's a good model for disinhibition. Yeah. I liked it. I, 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 it meant a lot to me. And, and, I, and it's really thereafter, I, I think, you know, that helped. That was, you're talking about 2013, 14, which is when a lot of this, the, the color really started to go much, become much more pronounced and, and wild and embarrassing to me. And, and you know, I hadn't really thought of it in terms of the timeline, but that question makes me think that she, her, watching her do that in the last two years of her mm -hmm. artistic life, I, you know, I know, it, I know it hit me hard, and it was kind of a miracle to me, but it uh, influenced me too, yeah. You've used the word contradiction and argument, the words contradiction and argument yeah. a number of times, and I'm interested in the way you're, you use contradiction in terms of um, later work contradicting earlier work or ar your work arguing with tradition. I'm also fascinated by how much of your work embodies contradiction internally. There's control and chance within a single work. There's, as you said, with the perforated vessels, there's this durability and fragility, um, density and porousness at the same time. Um, there's the organic and geometric that often are, coexist in the same work. What is it about that state of friction internally within a work that drives you, that interests you? I've never thought it was anybody's job or anybody's responsibility to be interested in my work. It's not their job. Um, it's not their obligation. It, I've always felt like it was my job, my obligation, to be really interested in my work and make my work interesting to me. And if I could do that, it might be interesting to other people. It just might be. So I, I try to build in, uh, uh, like, I've always loved irony, ironic, even when it 
it, it borders on very dark comedy, you know, or, or just dark subjects sometimes. The, the irony of being alive and, and our, our collective and, and singular experiences in life sometimes feels so ironic to me. And, 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 and I think for something to be ironic, there's got to be some kind of duality that one, where one thing plays against another in, in ways. And, and so I, I, I enjoy things that are dynamic like that and, and dynamism. And so I, I want to build that into my work as much as I can with whatever language I'm using at the time. And sometimes it's modest, you know. I felt like it was modest early on. But uh, the, the, the masculine and feminine and light and dark and organic and geometric and all of those things that operate as in, in a dualistic way are, have been, you know, I've called on that stuff. Just to make it interesting to me. I, I ha- I, that has to be... Um, I haven't externalized, you know, I think artists slip all the time and we do all kinds of things, but for most of the time, I think because I've worked with Clay for so long, I've never assumed that that many people were very interested in what I was doing. I never felt like I was working for an audience, per se. So, um, whether that's true or not, that's the way I felt. And so I felt I was working for me. (laughs) And I wanted to make things that were interesting to me and that left a mark, you know, left a mark. And so uh, I, I taught the same way. I wanted to leave a mark. And um, so I think that's really what it's about. How, however, I could find a, a language or mechanisms or devices or um, to, to allow there to be this, uh, to, to activate the internal space, uh, this arena that, that I would create, or a, a external space, or it had to kind of reach a certain vibration threshold internally for me to be to stay interested and to keep working and, and, then, and, and to allow it to, to go out into the world too. You're obviously dealing with elemental forces of heat and gravity, um, very geologic, as you said, ceramics is earth science. I also feel like those forces... Um, give motion and change and directionality to objects that are otherwise static. Can you, can you talk a little about the elemental? Um, so it's, it's like a, I don't know what a good analogy is, you know, but it's like, I don't feel like I have control I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to kind of parse it in terms of percentages, you know, but I, I feel like a lot of the time, most especially now, more especially in the last 10 or 15 years, I, I have learned, I've taught myself in ways that are interesting to me to set up a condition, you know, and then out of that, something's going to happen, and that I, you know, um, in some ways I'm accountable for it, in some ways I'm not, and, and I enjoy that a lot. It, 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 it's that kind of, like I said, that wonderful intersection of nature and culture. It's, it's me setting things up and, and then subjecting them to a little bit of hell in a kiln, you know, getting them too hot or, getting, you know. And, and, then, and then things are going to take over, and there's so many complicated things that happen when, when things get hot and things start to move because they melt and things start to intertwine, and then they stop and they crystallize. And, you know, all of that stuff is really kind of, magical and my my way of dealing with all of that has been um, it's it's a you know the process teaches me and so I don't take notes I'm bad at it anyway when I used to take notes I go back and look at them I can't read them or I can't decipher what I was thinking about at the time in shorthand and, they, and so a lot of notes were never really that useful to me I mean some glazed notes that, you know those are good to have but um, increasingly, I, 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 the whole history of pottery is built on reproducible results, you know. And so it's about refining the science to the degree that you can reproduce results and take your stuff and sell it, you know. That has to be. And, and that's, one of the, that's one of my arguments, you know. I, 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 I actually want to be spelunking in a cave and discovering this stuff. And, I, and so I don't want reproducible results as uh, de facto, you know, I, 
that, that's going to happen. And I'm going to understand how to reproduce things just naturally. And I'm going to want to reproduce some things naturally. But um, moreover, it's important for me not to take notes, uh, to subvert everything, to subvert all the materials I'm working with by adding other things and mixing them, firing them at the wrong temperatures, layering them incongruently, not in ways you're supposed to, and firing things upside down um, a as an argument with craft history and craft protocol and, and craft dogma that, um, that always says this is the way you must do it if you want success. And I fully understand it, I just don't, and I agree with it actually, for potters, but I don't, I just, um, I want to argue with it because I like the results and the argument, and, and, and it's an argument I want to win. <laughs> How about that? So, uh, uh, it's fun, it's enjoyable, it's, it's, it's energizing to take, on, to take on something that big and to understand what it's done to me, first of all. To understand that how, how it's affected the way I've thought and taught and over the years and understand it well enough so I can argue with it and um, subvert it. And, um, I, I feel like that is, that's a clearer path to the unknown for me um, in, in things that I might discover along the way. That's exciting to me. That gives me a lot of energy. I want to get up every day. I can't wait and just see what can happen. It feels magical, you know. And, and so, um, th that's the way that I've taught myself to work, and out of my own enjoyment. And I feel like, you know, and because I'm a teacher, I, I talk about it all the time, but boy, hopefully life's long, you know. Mm -hmm. And you get to work 50 years like I did. And I uh, did, past tense, still am. <laughs> and, so you, you should prepare for that, you know, but um, you, you need to understand how your education affects you and you need to make things you love making. If you want to do it for a long period of time, um, you need to make things you love. There's no other way. And you, if you externalize it too much and try to make stuff everyone that you think everyone loves, it's not going to work. You need to make things you love. And, uh, that'll keep you in it for a long time. That's kept me in it for a long time. I really enjoy making what I make. I love making it. I love the process of it, even all the failure. And uh, I think the failure is great. And I, I seek failure, actually. It's weird. I, I don't... I will do things that I know are a mess, and I'll open a kiln and it'll be a disaster. And I'll see some, some kind of mess I've never seen, and it's horrifying to me on a certain level. It's horrifying because of my... Uh, all the things I know about how you're supposed to do stuff. And, and yet, I'll, I'll, I'll like, okay, how am I going to get myself out of this? How, what am I going to do next to try to correct this? And maybe, and I've never seen this problem, and then I just had something split in half. <laughs> what, how am I going to recover this? And, and sure enough, I'll, and so I'll try something. And maybe, and I'll have to invent something. And I'll come up with something that I haven't done. And it leads me somewhere else. And, and that, that's a blessing to me. No, it used to be a curse. And now it's a blessing. You've talked about teachers of yours over time who've mm -hmm. modeled ways of being more, more mm -hmm. maybe than a certain way of working, but a way of being. And it sounds like that might be your most valuable role as a teacher in these years is to, to model this kind of embrace of experimentation and failure and openness. I, I think one of my strengths as a teacher is, is not to have uh, centered my teaching on my work. Mm. I, do, I do model a certain kind of behavior because, because I'm right there in the open. And, um, but, and it's good for some people. It's really good for some people, but not everyone at all. Especially in a state college where we got people coming in from everywhere. You know, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, I've, had, I've taught classes where we've had, uh, I've had students from nine different countries in the same class. I was like, wow. I can't even pronounce all their names, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I, f I fully understand that it's a state college and that people coming in from all over and first time to college and a lot of things. And so I, I feel like my strength has been to surround myself for constantly with interesting, diverse, talented people. Whether they're on a faculty teaching or they're artists in the building working. Um, and, and I've and, and so we, we, load up the, we load up the smorgasbord with lots of different things. That's, that's been something I've always been interested in. I've known it. 
And, and then I, I just make a big mess for students and they have to figure it out. They have to figure out what they're interested in, who's interesting to them or who's not. And, and I just think that um, in education, the, the most important thing that teachers can do is be clear. And some of the most powerful teachers I've had was because of their clarity so that I could fully disagree with them. I knew what they were, I knew what they represented, I knew what they stood for, and I couldn't run in the, in the other direction fast enough, but I, I was grateful for their clarity. Mm. So I like I liked that. I liked having lots of different models in the building all the time and for our students, and so that they had to figure it out. It wasn't me telling them. You know, uh, It was me just facilitating lots of things and, um, and them not being passive. I felt like that was the other thing. You can't be passive. And I learned that in Japan. <laughs> Yeah. Because of the way you've structured the program here, bringing in so many different voices and approaches and ideas as models uh, to your students, uh, I'm wondering if your exposure to that over the decades rendered you a perpetual student as well. <laughs> Uh, well, like I said about my work, you know, I, the same thing, teaching, uh, as, as much as I've taught people, I've been taught, you know, and uh, the whole experience of running a program and, and using a program as a tool. You know, I, I never, I, I realized that when I retired uh, from full-time teaching that I, I couldn't have been less interested to, to, to walk into a classroom and teach somebody how to make a pinch pot or throw on the wheel. It did not interest me at all. I, I've done a lot of that. I've done, you know. I've understood it as part of the matrix of teaching, you know, and very important, but if that was the only thing I was going to do, I was not very interested in that. But running a program was really interesting. It was like playing chess, you know, because you had so many different moving mm -hmm. parts that you could use to educate people. And, and, you know, from international travel to visiting artists to the, a, a broad curriculum and lots of facilities and equipment and access to all kinds of esoteric materials and, you know. And so all of that taught me and influenced me a lot. And it's why I don't want to go do residencies very much. I, I want to be here. I think mm. this is the most fascinating place. And, um, you know, we've got 40 kilns, and we've got lots of great students and lots of great artists here all the time. We're tw we, we used to be 24-7, 365, you know. We, we ran year-round through the summers and the, every, through the winter breaks and everything. And it was just a constant beehive of activity. So it was great to be here. It taught me everything, you know. I feel like if I had been locked away somewhere and taught a class and gone home and not, you know, um, I, I don't know what I'd be. I, but it's been great to be here. It's been great to be, have been a part of it. And to have met so many interesting people, my God. And, and I mean students, too. And, I, and I'm talking about even 10-year-old kids that have been here that have lit me up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and people that are much, much older than that by a lot. Uh, I kind of don't care about age or, or degrees or anything. Um, I, I, I want to be around people that are interesting and creatively engaged and have some kind of vibrancy and that, those are the people I love. And, yeah. Over the years I know you've gravitated um, to bringing into this arena a lot of artists who are not primarily clay people who haven't come up through ceramics education mm -hmm. but as painters or sculptors in other media. What, uh, what about that uh, works for the program and how does it expand? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's worked for us and against us, you know. Mm. And um, I started doing that at, at about increasing, I, I did it, you know, I think the first person I brought here was a painter, you know, in 1985, but um, it, it came and went, you know, and, um, but it, it became very, very strong impulse in me uh, around 2005. And I could, I could start to see things changing. And um, ceramics and, as a craft medium was hitting a wall and in the world. And it was kind of imploding on itself in a way. And because it was in its own niche, dead end niche really, and high craft. And, but it was starting to kind of filter out into art and you could see it and feel it. And artists were the ones who were not trained to work with clay, who were working with clay, that, that actually were getting a lot of play because they were known for other things. 
And that was starting to wake people up, and I became increasingly interested in that and, and just decided that um, I was going to use this facility here um, to bring any artist from L.A., any and every artist that wanted to come here and work, they could come here and work, and we wouldn't say no to anything, and we would help them make their work. And that's very problematic, though, because it's a university. It's not just an atelier, and artists are very, very different than ceramists. And ceramics people are very communal, very sweet by nature and to a fault. And, 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 and I think uh, craft dogma has shrunk them a little bit. It's like, oh, I can't try that. It'll go and mm. flop in the kiln. It'll crack. It'll break. It'll, and, you know, mm. I want to work in porcelain and make it precious. And it's not, you know, I'm overstating it. But th there's, there's something about the way artists were so unabashedly aggressive about mm. trying things and not caring and having wild ideas that were not cultured by craft protocols and bringing ideas to us to make things. I'm like, wow, I can't say no, but you better be ready for some failure. <laughs> we'll figure it out, you know. But, and, I, and I thought, wow, this is great for students too because it, I could just, I felt like in my own, the things I was part of, the galleries I was part of, the, it was just dying. There, there, there mm -hmm. was not any vibrancy in it. You know, and um, I felt like there was not going to be a future in that for students either. And students were going to have to go out and compete with artists in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the wide open territory, the expanded field of co contemporary art. And so they needed to be around artists and learn to think like more like artists and less like crafters and potters and things like that. And so I became less interested in bringing um, people that were educated in ceramics because I almost kind of knew what they were going to make in a way. Mm. I felt like I, it was my arrogance, you know, but I felt like I knew how they were going to talk, how they thought, what they were going to make, and if I knew what school they were coming from, especially. And, but artists, I didn't. And we had wild people here, you know, that wrecked us, wrecked me. But I, I let it go on because I felt there was real value in it. And I also felt that it was, it was good because it helped in a, in a small way. It helped... Um, lay the groundwork for um, the appreciation of ceramics in LA because there was more, we're sending more ceramics out into LA, into the galleries and the museums and, and beyond. And, um, and artists were coming here, and you know, people like Ruby Neri. Uh, and it, we, I kept to her long enough that it allowed her to grow artistically. She didn't need to be taught anything. I mean, she's, you know, autodidactic. But um, the way she thought was really different for us, and the way she did things was really different for us, the level on which she operated. Kristen Morgan, too, in a way. And they just changed things and, and, and really grew their work and put their work out there and got notice and let, gave Clay much more vibrancy in Southern California that helped. And I saw that, and I liked it, and, I, and so I just kept doing that. It's very natural. It seemed like the natural, smart thing to do for, for students here and for ceramics and for artists. And it helped artists. It helped us. It helped the school. It helped, helped everybody. I liked it. It's a good win, 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 all the way around. A lot of fruitful cross-pollination. Yeah, and, and we had a lot of artists here at the same time, and they started talking to one another and helping one another. And students helped them. And, um, and there, there was a, a growing sense of community, too, which... I really started to understand the importance of it. And, um, and students stayed in touch, and I've stayed in touch with a lot of artists, and we help each other to this day. I was just talking to Roger, you know. And, and so there was a lot of good things that came out of all that, and, and, it, and, it, and it goes on still, you know. The, the CCC, as it's known now, uh, Center for Contemporary Ceramics, has been institutionalized at the university, and so it has a permanent place here. And it's been, it's, we raised money, it's, it's, it's going to have a, an endowment, and it'll, be, it'll run in perpetuity. And so it's not just run by, on a personality, you know. It's, it's, got, it's institutionalized, and so it'll continue to do really great things for students and for artists and for the field and for galleries and everything, yeah. It, those romantic kind of tropes and ceramics are too easy for me. They're a lot of hard work. But they're too easy to turn something over to a kiln and, and, um, and all the wonderful things that happen because of that. And don't get me wrong, I love that stuff. And I grew up on it, you know. And I built wood kilns and I fired wood kilns in Japan. It's all about that. And, and I think that when I came back, I didn't want to do that. And, um, but 
the, the magic inherent in those things is in my work. I'm, I'm, find, I'm trying to find other pathways to the magic that wood and salt and soda and raccoon offer. You know, so I, I think, it, especially if you look at the crucible, some of the crucibles, I, I think that's my reckoning with wood firing and trying to find my own language that evokes the same mystery as wood firing does. You know, in, in, a, in, a, in a more, um, kind of in a more modern way. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about the scale of your work. How have you kept the scale fairly consistent through a lot of other changes of texture and color and orientation? What is it about this scale that resonates with you? I think about scale a lot. Um, and when I was making work that was more minimal, I, I, I was very aware of kind of kind of like tabletop scale with vessels. And, and I felt like, especially if you're making something that's very minimal anyway, and it's got a minimal form language and surface language and all that, um, it's very dismissible. You know, if you start to work in this very domestic uh, vessel-based scale that deals with tabletop pottery scale, that's very dismissible, especially if what you're, whatever you might have to say is very minimal. And, and that, made, that made me anxious, you know. And so... I, there, there are a lot of those things that, you know, from the 90s where I was, I had just come back from grad school and started to make my work that was content driven that are like three and four feet, but they're still simple, you know. And they were jumped up a little bit in scale so that they wouldn't be quite as dismissible mm. as a tabletop mm. object. And what I found was that I ended up working a lot to the scale of my torso, mm. um, from the waist to the chin, you know. And, I like that scale. It's a very intimate scale. It's, it's human scale. It, um, there, there's something about it that is identifiable by pe- so, uh, curiously. Uh, you, ju- you just, it's kind of there. You kind of understand, you know, these things in a, in a, in intimately in relationship to the scale of the human body. Um, so you could almost embrace anything that I make. Um, uh, you, you could hold it to your chest. You know? mm. Mm. Kind of thought about it like that. You've talked about the different jobs a vessel does. And one of the ones I'm really interested in that you have your vessels do is um, act as um, ve- vehicles for display of other objects. They contain other objects, and some of them have ledges and shelves where they're, in a way, displaying uh, objects. Uh, I'm just curious if you could talk a little about that function. Yeah. Um, I'm not a painter, and I'm not a photographer. And so there there's certain things that I... Um, and so I don't paint and draw, really. And... You know, for instance, the moon jars I have objects placed on the outside of the vessel instead of the inside of the vessel. And, and so I think about those things sometimes like uh, Greek vases, you know, which, which put on display on the outside of a vessel through drawing, mm. through beautiful drawing. Um, th- they tell stories, you know. And, and so I think about it like that. But, but I don't draw. I'm, I'm very, very dimensionally driven. I understand form and space and um, like that. And I, I don't actually, I don't really draw. I mean, I, I, I doodle and I, I, I draw triggers and things like that, things that I'll look at later and I'll understand what I'm doing. But I don't, as a practice, I don't draw. And I, I'm not proud of that, you know. I wish I, I, I drawing's one of my favorite art forms. I, it's so raw and kind of naked and expressive of thinking. And so I love drawing, but I don't, I just don't, it doesn't, it doesn't register with me. I don't understand two-dimensional illusion at all. I, I, so when I, like with these moon jars, I, the, the rocks that are on those moon jars are not rocks. They're, they're fabricated ceramic objects. And they, they kind of tell this story, this geologic story of time, pressure, material, um, crystallization. And, and so it's abstracted, but... It's a, it's a story told on the outside of a form, 
after so many years of, of doing the same thing on the inside. And, and I, over time, I just wanted to try to find all the different devices that, you know, whether I'm just piling stuff up and trying to basically fill a vessel like water would with objects, um, or whether I'm pinning things in place so they're kind of levitating and floating within the space of a bowl, or whether I'm building shelves and placing them, or however it would be, I just tested lots of different ideas, delivery systems, um, and, and then the kinds of things that I was putting in vessels too. Um, you know, from masculine, very clearly masculine and feminine objects in the same vessel sometimes, um, to things that I would find, I started collecting plants, and I, um, in the springtime, a lot of the plants I was collecting had these wild um, reproductive organs that I would um, cut and take molds from, and then cast and, and place in vessels in different ways. And, and I would cut them and um, kind of curate them in ways that you, sometimes unless you were a botanist, you couldn't tell what they were, but you could sense that, um, that it was, there was fresh spring reproductive growth mm -hmm. in there. You could sense it. They're, they're all porcelain, so they're kind of like ghosts, you know, that, you know, but uh, reproducing clay. But um, I was just trying to tell that story, you know, of being in a garden, my garden, and then finding a, a vessel to commemorate that. And, um, I think also, like, I've noticed a lot of things um, that the, the natural world and how it's shrinking on us, you know, from the, the, when I grew up fishing and the things I could catch then versus what I catch now. And, and I think that a lot, that the, a lot of reliquaries, I, I, would, I made things in the 90s I called reliquaries for the natural world. And I would put, I would take plant matter and, uh, and use those and kind of commemorate those in, in, in individual reliquary-like spaces within the, I did that for a while. And so I, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of an abstract, an abstracted storytelling as a painter would, except that I paint. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like a lot of the perforated pieces too allow me to deal with light in the way that photographers deal with light, that I don't deal with light because I'm not a photographer, or painters deal with light. Um, but it's just my, my, my pathway to that, that weird thing, to, to deal with light uh, or to deal with storytelling. Um, just found my own language for that. Um, big question, big, um, I, big, se big issue, time. I just, just want to hear your thoughts on <clears throat> how you engage time in your work. Uh, we've talked about geologic time in the moon jars with the specimens, you're talking about a kind of cos cosmic time. But this, this show encompasses several decades of your life, so you're, you're also dealing with personal time, and phases of your own life, and things that matter differently to you over time. How, are you thinking consciously of time when you're working? Time is scandalous, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't believe, I, I, I can't believe I'm the age that I am. Hmm. I can't believe all this time's passed. And it, it, it makes me very anxious, you know. I'm, you lose your parents and you get to a certain age and people are dropping off <laughs> all around you. And, um, you start to think more and more of your own mortality. I, I don't, you're not really asking about that, but in, in the, the bigger picture of time, um, and I, I think about, okay, if I'm this age now, if I'm 68 now, and I can work for 10 more years, and I think about what I made in the last 10 years, how many things I made, and I've only got that many more things left in me if I can work, and it's like, wow, that's highly motivating. And, and it makes me much more, like today, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've turned a whole day over to this, which is rare, to turn a whole day over to anything, because it's important, you know. But I want to work every day if I can. And time's funny because, like, like acts of devotion, like I was telling you earlier about um, doing things without foreknowledge of reward. <sighs> So a lot of the work I've done, it, 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 they take repeated firings, or they take a long time if I'm, if I'm drilling holes and things one hole at a time. Um, they're acts of devotion. 
and, and they'll take whatever time they need to take. And, and, and pottery and ceramics has this time frame where everything's pretty quick, actually, um, in a lot of ways. And I have to constantly argue with that. It's like, no, take the time you need to take to make the thing you want to make. And, um, and I think about time and making a lot. And, and I, I, I kind of, I'll let the clock run on, on an object when I'm making it. And, and so some things, I've worked on some things for a year, you know. Um, but I'm very anxious about the clock just running and not, and not doing things. And so I, I stay in motion a lot, kind of like a shark that needs to swim to keep, to keep oxygen flowing, you know. And I, because I worry about time. And I, I think, you know, like I, I've been in Italy a lot and uh, spent summers there. And I, I go to the Bargello in Florence and I go look at the objects in the second floor. And I look at the Bible boxes and I look at the, and, I, and I'll look at something that's made in the 17th century by a crafter who was enormously talented and, and it's a carved Bible box, the whole story of the damn Bible <laughs> on a box, you know, that the Bible went into for the Pope or something. And, and I think, God, that had to take 12 years for someone to make, who died at 40, who, di who devoted, who, who gave over some remarkable part of their life to the making of an object. And, and so I, I just think about stuff like that, you know. And I, and I don't care what it takes to make something. That, that, the clock is open and running on that. I never question it. I never try to speed things up like that. But I am anxious about time, very anxious about time. And I just want to work, you know. I'm probably going to work tonight. <laughs>